Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Until recently, Turkey relied on trade, diplomacy and geography to project power abroad. Democracy and commerce would win allies and leverage it to achieve strategic ends. Unfortunately, that's not how it works in the real world. Amid a decade of volatility brought on by the Arab Spring uprisings of 2011, Turkey learned the limits of its soft power. And, as threats enclosed on Turkish soil, another lesson was learned. Restraint is a virtue only when there is an alternative. And just like that, starting from 2014, Turkey took on an increasingly assertive foreign policy to achieve strategic autonomy. It established foreign bases, expanded its military and built a domestic defense industry. So why did Turkey shift gears and how has this expression of power altered the periphery? I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Today's episode is sponsored by Curiosity Stream, a streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries from some of the world's best filmmakers. It's the Netflix for nerds or the Hulu for history buffs. Curiosity Stream works on most platforms, it's available worldwide and they frequently add new content. For additional insight into Turkish politics and history, have a look at Gallipoli 1915 and Istanbul from one empire to the other. These documentaries will contribute to your understanding of where Turkey is coming from. Using our link below you will get unlimited access for only $2.99 a month or just $19.99 for the whole year. That is a terrific deal and a good way to support Caspian Report because it lets us make more content. Now, if you want to test things out, you can. There is a 30-day free trial available. Just go to curiositystream.com Caspian and use the promo code Caspian during the sign-up process. Turkey's geographic position between Europe and Asia, between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, puts it at the center of a complex environment tied to different political and cultural landscapes. The common belief is that geography ascends Turkey as a bridge between East and West, allowing it to project power into the Balkans, the Mediterranean, the Caucasus, the Middle East and Central Asia. That observation is true but incomplete. When the periphery is volatile, power projection reverses into the Turkish homeland. Whether it's hostilities in Syria, sanctions on Iran, insurgents in Iraq, refugees from Afghanistan or Russian activities in Ukraine and the Black Sea or even instability in the Caucasus and the Balkans. All these events and more affect Turkish interests at home, even if Turkey has nothing to do with them. The same geography that bestows Turkey with unmatched regional influence also exposes the country to unique challenges and threats. To put it metaphorically, when someone in the area sneezes, Turkey catches a cold. At around the turn of the millennium, in the 2000s, policymakers in Ankara navigated regional affairs through soft power. There was an effort to synchronize democracy, secularism and Islamic dogma with a liberal economy. The policy worked and the Turkish Republic became a prototype for other Middle Eastern states to follow. For a while, Turkish soft power appeared to pay off, but before long, geographic realities tempered political ambitions. In a policy paper published by the Washington-based New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy, Dr. Ali Bakir from Qatar University examines Turkey's shift from soft power to hard power and how it turned Ankara into a regional power broker. Beginning in 2010, political demonstrations swept across the Arab world, overturning governments in some states. Turkish officials had to decide whether to side with the ruling governments or with the revolting masses. Since the Turkish Republic was considered a source of inspiration at the time, it was deemed fatal for Ankara to side with the governments. Turkey saw the Arab Spring as an opportunity to reshape the Middle East. And just so, policymakers in Ankara took a gamble and sided with the popular uprisings. But things didn't quite turn out as expected. 
in Syria, a complex civil conflict risked tearing the nation apart. Turkey stepped in as a mediator, pleading with the al-Assad government to stop using excessive force. In exchange, Ankara would provide Damascus with economic and diplomatic support to carry out reforms and facilitate a peaceful transition of power. President al-Assad recognized the inherent danger of liberalizing a volatile Syria, so instead he suppressed the rebels with force and turned to Iran for aid. Tensions escalated, refugees rushed to Turkey, and the Syrians withdrew their forces from northern Syria with the motive to concede territories to PKK-affiliated militants to establish a buffer between Syria and Turkey. What followed was an upsurge in cross-border attacks from PKK and YPG militants. Then, in 2015, Russia intervened in the Syrian battle space, tipping the balance against Turkey. Political rhetoric became more reckless. But when Turkey shot down a Russian jet for violating its airspace, NATO offered Turkey only half-hearted support. Still more troubling, Washington extended aid to Kurdish forces in northern Syria, which bolstered separatist sentiment. At this point, Turkey had no choice but to acknowledge that its soft power was futile in this type of strife. So, Ankara switched to hard power to prevent further rollback of its influence. At the end of the day, force is the supreme authority from which all others are derived. The sea change came in 2014 with the election of then Prime Minister Erdogan to the presidency. Abandoning soft power, Ankara began developing independent military capabilities. The transition came about swiftly because Turkey already possessed all the building blocks needed. It had a large population, a determined army, a vast economy, and a dynamic arms industry. Pursuing strategic autonomy allowed Turkish policymakers to go after objectives without outside support. As things settled into place, Turkey's newfound hard power produced new, assertive defense and security doctrines and foreign policies. The result was extraterritorial military operations, forward military bases, and military deployments on foreign soils. Turkish military strength was on display at land, sea, and air in remote places such as North Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean, the South Caucasus, the Horn of Africa, the Levant, and the Gulf region. But this new hard power stance meant the sacrifice of Ankara's democratic credentials. State power was centralized and the executive's role in shaping policy was expanded. But even so, security concerns trumped all else. And Turkey accepted the trade-off as a measure to consolidate its footing. Before long, Ankara was bringing its newfound power to bear. In 2016, the country launched Operation Euphrates Shield, followed by Operation Olive Branch two years later. These twin operations established a buffer zone in northern Syria, deterring jihadist forces, Iranian-backed militias, and PKK-affiliated insurgents. This was then followed by intervention in northern Iraq in 2019 and the Syrian city of Idlib in 2020. Turkey has since established 114 military posts in Syria and 37 in Iraq, most of which sit face to face with Russian forces, Al-Assad's forces, PKK insurgents, Iranian IRGC forces and affiliated militias like Hezbollah. By setting up these forward bases, Turkey secured its southern frontier while gaining leverage over geopolitical rivals. The Turkish bases also created a safe zone for Syrian civilians and prevented the further influx of refugees into Turkey, which already hosts the world's largest refugee population. At the same time, Ankara established mutual defense agreements with Qatar, Somalia, Sudan and Libya allowing it to build bases in the Gulf, the Middle East, and the Horn of Africa. These developments have granted Turkey a foothold to project influence, dismantle threats, and bolster its credibility. In 2017, Turkey demonstrated itself as a power broker during the Qatar diplomatic crisis. When Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates primed to infringe on Qatar, 
Turkey dispatched troops to the Gulf and possibly disrupted an invasion of the island state. The Turks are also involved with Iraqi and Kurdish Iraqi authorities in their efforts to train professional troops to combat insurgents. Ankara's influence has reached as far as Somalia. A Turkish military training academy known as Turksom has trained more than 4,000 law enforcement and military personnel to date. The effort has strengthened Somalia's capacity to combat jihadist forces. Moreover, since 2019, Ankara has assisted the UN-recognized Tripoli government in Libya to modernize its security forces. This has included the provision of aid and training in the use of mortars, air defense systems, coast guard operations and special forces. Additional military facilities are planned in Libya, including a naval base in Misrata and an airbase in al Watiya. Meanwhile, Turkey is looking to shore up its standing in the Red Sea by establishing a base at the former Ottoman outpost on Suakin Island. Ankara recently took out a 99-year lease on the island, which it plans to redevelop as a port. Doing so would grant leverage over Saudi Arabia and Egypt. But for now, operations on the island are confined to civilian purposes. The last component of Turkey's hard power strategy has been to grow its sea power in the Black Sea, the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. The doctrine, known as Blue Homeland, uses legal and military tools to protect maritime interests. This includes ensuring freedom of navigation, maritime rights and advancing Turkish claims to seabed resources in the area. It's worth noting that about 87% of Turkey's foreign trade is carried out by sea, so there's very little room for compromise. To that end, Turkey has stationed a fleet of aerial vehicles in northern Cyprus and plans on enhancing its air power by deploying them on its floating base soon to be in service, the TCG Anadolu light aircraft carrier. Now, Turkey's ability to project hard power is tied to the concept of defense autarky, or self-sufficiency. Since 2014, foreign arms imports have dropped by nearly 60% as the Turkish defense industry has matured. By 2019, more than three quarters of Ankara's defense procurements came from domestic sources. The turnaround has been extraordinary. In the last 15 years, Turkey went from the world's third largest importer of weapons to the 14th biggest arms exporter. Turkish defense companies design and produce all sorts of strategic weapons, including frigates, submarines, helicopters, artilleries, rockets and missiles. The country is currently in the midst of developing a main battle tank, a fifth generation jet fighter and several variations of unmanned naval vehicles. Having turned into a major arms exporter, Ankara not only enhances its power projection but gained the ability to tip the balance in regional conflicts. For instance, in Libya, Syria and Azerbaijan, Turkish drones successfully pushed back Russian-backed forces. As a result, more clients are in line to purchase Turkish weapons and more nations are offering Ankara a foothold on their soil. Though Turkey's need to modernize its hard power is the result of rising threats across the periphery, it has been a costly endeavor. In spite of economic downturns, Turkish officials have kept increasing military spending, which has paid off but also contributed to the current account deficit that the country is experiencing. Without a robust economy, it will be increasingly difficult to maintain military missions abroad. Even the little things could become a pain. For instance, Turkey's military industry still relies on imported components, but the Lira's recent depreciation makes such acquisitions difficult since these parts are priced in foreign currency. On top of all this, Ankara's pursuit of strategic autonomy has made its Western partners reluctant to share technology with it. So, while strategic autonomy has its benefits, it also precludes outside help. Even so, a strategy based solely on hard power is ever unsustainable. If current trends continue, Turkey could face a situation where it is forced to choose between politics, economy and security. 
So while Ankara's shifting to hard power policy was initially driven by necessity, hard power is a means rather than an end. To cash in the gains it has thus far achieved, Turkey needs to reach sustainable agreements. It must match its proactive policy with resourceful diplomacy to smooth over existing tensions. Ideally, every state aims to be both respected and admired. But when forced to choose, conventional wisdom says that it's better to be feared than loved. I've been your host Chirvan from Caspian Report. If you like what we do, please consider joining our Patreon platform or YouTube membership program. Doing so helps us to remain self-sufficient and independent. Thank you for your time and Saul.